tried to imagine what it was like to wake up, say, one and a half million years ago. I mean, really imagine it. No cities, no farms, just you, your family, and your wits trying to survive. Well, today, that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're stepping back in time to spend a day with Homo erectus, the first of our ancestors to really look and move like us. And, you know, maybe the most successful human species that has ever lived. All right, so here's our game plan. First, we're gonna meet our ancestor, get to know them. Then we'll face the world they lived in, a world full of dangers. After that, we'll dive into their amazing technology, see the first sparks of society, and finally, we'll try to wrap our heads around their incredible two million year story. Okay, so our day kicks off at sunrise, somewhere out on the vast African savanna. And the individual who's waking up, this isn't some ape shuffling around in the trees, no. This is something new, a hominin standing tall on two long legs, totally ready to take on a world on the ground. Now, to really get who we're talking about, you have to appreciate their timeline. Homo erectus was an unbelievably successful species. They show up over two million years ago, and they don't disappear until just over 100,000 years ago. Think about that. They were also the very first hominins to walk out of Africa, spreading across huge parts of Asia and Europe. That right there tells you how adaptable they were. And just look at this transformation, it's incredible. On one hand, you have earlier ancestors like Australopithecus, who are still kind of built for climbing trees, you know, with the curved fingers and toes for grabbing branches. But Homo erectus, they went all in on life on the ground. They developed these long legs, a tall, slender frame, a body literally built to cover huge distances out on the open plains. One of our best windows into this new body plan comes from the famous Turkana boy skeleton. It's this amazingly complete fossil of a young male, and it shows us a creature with body proportions that are, well, they're shockingly similar to ours. He was tall, lean, and perfectly adapted for walking, probably even running, across the savanna. This wasn't some shuffling ape man. This was an endurance athlete in the making. And get this, we even know exactly how they moved, thanks to these footprints. Can you believe it? Preserved in stone for a million and a half years. And they are basically indistinguishable from yours or mine. You can see the modern arch, the big toe lined up with the others. It's all there, perfect for pushing off with every single stride. These aren't ape tracks. They're the tracks of a modern walker. So you've got this new body. You're out in the open. How was it tested? Well, being on two feet on the savanna makes you pretty visible. And the world back then, the Pleistocene, it was filled with enormous predators. I'm talking saber-toothed cats, giant hyenas. Alone, Homo erectus would have been an easy snack. But here's the thing. They were almost never alone. So how did they survive all that? You know, someone on the internet put it perfectly, if maybe a little bluntly. For any predator, attacking a Homo erectus was a really bad idea. It wasn't just about getting a meal. It was an invitation for some serious payback. Their greatest weapon wasn't a sharp tooth or a claw. It was each other. Their defense strategy was probably a pretty coordinated effort. So step one, someone spots a threat and shouts, raising the alarm. Step two, the whole group comes together, forming this intimidating mob of tall, upright apes. And then, step three, intimidation. They're yelling, they're waving their arms, and this is crucial, they're holding tools and throwing rocks. If you're a predator just looking for an easy lunch, this is a fight that's just not worth the risk. Okay, so as our group of Homo erectus moves through their day, staying alive isn't just about playing defense. It's about getting food, and to do that, they relied on a technology that was so successful, so game-changing, that it would dominate the human story for over a million years. This is what's called the Oculean industry, and it is a massive upgrade from the older tools, which were pretty much just simple choppers. Oculean tools, on the other hand, they show design, they show symmetry, they show forethought. This wasn't just about banging rocks together anymore. This was about shaping a rock with a very specific image in your mind. And the star of the show, without a doubt, is the hand axe. You should think of it as the original Swiss Army knife. It's got this perfect teardrop shape, 
a sharp point on one end and a cutting edge all the way around. It made it unbelievably versatile. It was a heavy duty knife for butchering big animals, an ax for shaping wood into something like a spear, and a travel for digging up nutritious roots. But hey, it wasn't just about the hand ax. Their toolkit was more diverse than that. It also had things like simpler choppers and scrapers, and this shows us they were really adaptable. They were making specific tools for specific jobs, whether that was processing plants or preparing animal hides. They were becoming true master craftspeople of the Stone Age. So, as evening comes, our group heads back to a home base. The sun goes down and the darkness brings a whole new set of dangers. And it's right here that we come across what is maybe the most transformative and honestly the most debated technology of all, the control of fire. This is one of the absolute biggest questions in the field. I mean, mastering fire would have been a total game changer. It gives you warmth, light, protection from predators, and a brand new way to get more energy from your food through cooking. But the evidence from this far back is incredibly hard to interpret, and it's led to a huge scientific debate. So you have this fascinating puzzle. On one hand, their biology seems to be screaming, we're cooking. The cooking hypothesis basically says that you can't fuel a bigger brain and have a smaller gut without the extra calories from cooked food. But then, on the other hand, the hard evidence, I'm talking about clear, human-made fireplaces, that stuff doesn't really show up for another million years or so. So what gives? Were they true fire monsters, or were they just clever opportunists, grabbing flames from lightning strikes when they could? But here's the thing. Whether they could make fire whenever they wanted, or just manage to capture it from nature, having a controlled fire would have been profound. It creates what you might call social gravity. It pulls everyone together. It extends the day into the night, giving you precious hours for social bonding, for communication, for sharing skills, all while keeping the things that go bump in the night far away. The fireside? It was probably the very first crucible where our complex social world started to form. As our day in the life of Homo erectus comes to an end, let's just zoom out for a second. Their daily struggles, their brilliant innovations, their social bonds, all of that laid the foundation for everything that came after them. Their story is, in a very real sense, the first chapter of our own. Just let that number sink in. Two million years. Our own species, Homo sapiens, we've only been around for about 300,000 years. By the simple, brutal math of longevity, Homo erectus isn't just one of our ancestors. They are the most successful human species that has ever walked the earth, period. They were the true pioneers. They built the foundation for us. They were the first to have bodies like ours, the first to make really sophisticated tools, and the first to bravely venture out of Africa. Yeah, we went on to develop art and agriculture and global societies, but everything we are is built on top of the biological and social platform they created almost two million years ago. And that brings us to a final question. This ancient ancestor survived for two millennia. They made it through massive climate shifts, ice ages, and countless dangers. Their story is a powerful testament to resilience, to cooperation, and to innovation. That legacy of survival, it's in our hands now. So, what can we learn from their incredible journey?